My name is Richard Kozicki. I'm with the company Redis Labs, headquartered in Mountain View. Um, is everyone here familiar with Redis? I think most of you are. Thank you for confirming. Um, I wanted to spend only a few minutes here um, letting you know what's going on at Redis. I think I can enca encapsulate that message in the context of a few minutes. You may be aware that the founder of Redis, open source, Salvatore Sanfilippo, left VMware Pivotal in July of this year, and he moved to Redis Labs. So the official sponsorship of the Redis open source project has changed from VMware to Redis Labs. So we're the official commercial sponsor of the Redis open source project. We're also the guardian of the open source. So Salvatore and his team are focused entirely on maintaining the source code and what gets into the source code of the product. And there's a second team that I belong to, Redis Labs, that does the commercial wrapper for the Redis open source product. The commercial wrapper is designed to provide enterprise class features for the Redis open source technology. So Redis open source was developed by um, Salvatore, AKA Antires, in 2009. And in 2011, Redis Labs was formed to say, let's take this great open source, um, the fastest database in the world technology, and let's put a commercial wrapper so enterprises will be able to put mission critical data in memory. And that's what we've accomplished. So we've uh, hired approximately 40 engineers that have been working on this product well, since 2011. So we've added approximately 150 developer years of technology onto the open source to provide advanced clustering, nonstop failover, very advanced GUIs, both for dev and DevOps. So on the DevOps side, for example, we have uh, 20 dashboard screens that tell you everything relevant going on in the database in real time. We've got a number of very advanced projects, such as uh, flash extensions to memory that we're working on. So uh, take a look at Redis Labs. If you're interested in migrating from Redis to an enterprise class version of Redis, the product has done extremely well. We have over 5,300 customers worldwide in over 40 countries that are paying for the use of Redis Labs. Most of them were upgrades from Redis OSS because they wanted the enterprise class uh, technology and the 724 support that we provide. Okay, so I just wanted to give that little introduction and um, thank us for sponsoring the, the goodies back there. Uh, did everyone get a, a sticker for their laptop? Okay, we're all set on that front. All right, thanks for your time and then I'll pass the baton over to Flickr. All right, so, um, uh, so my name's Sean Cook and I work at Flickr. Uh, I work in the middle tier platform development area. And um, today we're going to talk about uh, how using console with Redis and Sentinel for uh, high availability. Um, so just to start off, um, uh, this is, would be considered a naive uh, Redis architecture. Master with a slave. Um, if the master fails, you know, you have to manually uh, uh, promote the slave, then you have to um, maybe do a config deploy or a code deploy to reconfigure your, your client to talk to host B. Lots of problems with this. You know, it's going to take you how long to be notified that there's a failure, then you have to respond manually, right? So now we have Sentinel, and of course that can, you know, respond and do all of that within just a few seconds. But you do have to update your client. You have to make a code change to your client um, to uh, allow it to uh, subscribe to Sentinel and then also to respond to the notifications and reconfigure itself on the fly. Now, all that can usually happen within uh, you know, four to 10 seconds, depending on your configuration and your situation and how, how quickly uh, Sentinel addresses the issue. Um, but again, you have like some, some invasive uh, uh, modifications to your client. Um, another thing I would point out here is if you look at the, if you look at the, uh, the client config, um, it's changed from, uh, from the IP address, from a rather verbose explicit IP address, to now using the, uh, um, the, uh, the service name. We're going to start calling that the service name right now, feature name, whatever. It's a human readable term that, that is, um, uh, correlates across the different configs, maybe in your code, in documentation, right? It's much easier to understand uh, when you're trying to maintain something, we see log messages than just some anonymous IP address. 
So why Sentinel didn't work for us? We, we use Sentinel at Flickr. Um, we have uh, maybe half a dozen, I don't know, I guess now we're up to about 20 or 30 um, cases out of about 60 of our Redis instances that use Sentinel. And it works really well. Um, we only have it working with our Java, with our Java clients right now. But we actually have several different clients, including Python, PHP, Twin Proxy. We have the clients distributed all over the network. Some of them are in Storm. Some, you know, some, some have different owners, right? So it's, we have a very diverse client set. Um, it would be really nice if we only had, you know, one Java app interacting with Sentinel. That would, you know, we'd be done a long time ago. But that's not the case. In particular, um, PHP is one of our primary tools, and um, it doesn't get along with Sentinel very well. The short-lived processes, it doesn't make sense to have those uh, fire up, uh, connect to Sentinel, get the Redis topology, handle a request, and go away. You know, you can have it maybe interact with the proxy. Uh, you could have it uh, have maybe have an external caching utility, uh, you know, on the same host with the PHP. There's ways to get around it, but, you know, you go back to the diverse client set. That's just handling our, our PHP layer. There's, you know, we want, can we get a, a ubiquitous solution for all the, all clients? One proxy we also have a little bit of problems with. We, uh, earlier this year, uh, we tried to connect Twin Proxy with Sentinel. Twin Proxy, of course, does not speak to Sentinel natively, um, and also the version that we're on, that we're using, um, uh, it, you can't uh, reconfigure it on the fly. You have to re rewrite your YAML config files and then restart the process. Uh, so we had a Python script that did a lot of that, but it's still, again, it's just Twin Proxy. You know, that's not it's not ubiquitous, and it's a little bit a little bit clumsy. So now here comes console. So how does console, uh, what is console? Um, uh, console is a key value store. Uh, it uh, specializes in service discovery and configuration management. Um, it's a really great tool. I really like using it. It has a lot of the same uh, attributes that I like about Redis in that right out of the box, really easy to install, really easy to configure, very intuitive, you know, great documentation, very active um, uh, um, community around it. Um, so if you like those things about Redis, you probably might want to take a look at, at console. Um, console also has several different interfaces. Um, the only two that I'm going to be talking about or that I used for this project is the full HTTP API and the DNS interface. The HTTP API is what I'm, I'm going to be using for all reads and writes, my programmatic reads and writes. And the DNS is going to be used for resolving from service names to physical hosts. Um, and that's the magic right there. That's what makes console work here, is that it's taking this, if we go back and look at this Redis cache right here, this, this, uh, this service name, it's going to convert that directly into, it's going to resolve that through a DNS interface into a physical host name. And it's going to make use of uh, DNS mask uh, as a DNS proxy. So and I'll explain, I'll demonstrate how that works. Um, also, to get this to work, I had to patch console. Uh, it's a small patch. The patch has already been um, approved and accepted. It's merged into the master branch. It's just waiting for, for the 06 release of, of console, which, you know, any day, maybe the next week or two, month or so, I don't know. So, okay, um, another con console concept is that console runs as, um, as a series of, of binary executables. But the binary executable that it runs as can be ran in, in one of two modes, either server or agent mode. If it runs as an agent, you have console agents running on all, all of your clients. Any client that wants to interact with, with console should be a console agent. And the console agent handles all of your reads and writes from that host, and then it replicates the, the information to the server, and the server replicates that back out to all the other agents. Um, and this is how uh, the app interacts, is going to interact with, with console and DNS mask. So um, uh, you're going to install a console agent on your, your host, on your Redis client host. And then you're also going to install DNS mask. And you're going to configure DNS mask to um, intercept all DNS requests on the host. The D DNS mask is, is, is then going to uh, take a look at the host name in the request. And it's going to determine if it's a console service name or if it's anything else. Console service names 
are then redirected to the console agent for uh, resolution. Otherwise, it's sent off to the DNS server. So once, uh, once this is in place, um, the whole host treats console service names as fully qualified host names. Um, you can ping the service name, you can SSH, and you can call directly from your app. You can utilize the service name as if it's a host name or an IP. Um, it resolves perfectly right there. Okay, so this is, and this is the, uh, how it fits into the broader architecture. Um, again, here's the server. This is what we just discussed. Here's the agent. You have the agents on all four of these hosts on this, on this example. Um, and uh, um, what else we've added here is, is a Python script. This right here is basically the only code that I had to write to get this to work. And it's only a couple hundred lines of Python. It's, it's not that extensive. Um, this Python script simply uh, subscribes to the Sentinel, and when the Sentinel notifies it of a change, then it writes those updates to the, con to the local console, console agent. That console agent replicates to the server, and the server in turn replicates to all other agents, including over here on, on your Redis client. You notice that now it's this Python script that's subscribing to Sentinel and not your app. Your app is no longer subscribing to Sentinel. Um, and in fact, at this point, the app has become completely um, unaware. It's been abstracted away from, from all of your, of your Redis uh, high availability logic. It really knows um, a service name, right? And as that service name uh, is changes, uh, as the resolution of that service name changes from one host to the other, you magically get that, that failover right here in your, in your app. Um, the data for, for console looks like this. Uh, this is very much uh, you know paraphrasing summary, but it gives you the idea. So again, both uh, both of your Redis instances are on host A and B, and when they uh, when the Redis starts up, you have to write a little logic, little scripting that registers that Redis instance with console for the service. Now both instances register for the same service, and, it, and going back. Again, this, Redis, this time the service name is redis-cache, right? So they're both registered for redis-cache. Now in console, you have a service name, redis-cache, and it's associated with an array of nodes. So here we have our two nodes with an address, the, the respective addresses, the port. Now here we're using the same port. Um, and now here we get to the interesting part. This is the tag. And you notice the tag, can you see that? Yeah. So now this is the difference the two nodes. You got master and slave. So when this when this Redis master comes up, your your uh, your your um, your scripting has has determined that that's going to be a master, and it has registered itself initially with the with the master tag, and likewise the slave as a slave. So that's inside console. Now the console the way console uses this data to resolve uh, to resolve to a uh, to a physical host. First, it extracts the information from here and turns it into um, this full service name. And it's of the form tag dot service name dot and then the static string service dot console. So this suffix that service dot console, that's the first thing that we look at when we go back to uh, DNS mask. That's, the su that's how DNS mask determines whether it's a, it's a console service or not. It sees that suffix and it goes here doesn't see that suffix, and it goes here. If you, here I have it written again. So if you exclude the, the service in your, remember this is your client config. So this is our Redis service name here. And I've written, I've configured this with master.redis-cache.service.console. If I forgot to put the word service in there, and it was just cache.console, uh, it would treat that as a host name and that would end up in an error as a demonstration. Same with slave. You can use it for the master or the slave. If you have multiple slaves, if you have more than one slave, they're all going to have the same tag and service name. And then I believe you can configure DNS mask for round robin or you know some sort of uh, resolution scheme. So. You can also I'm in these in these dim, these, uh, in these examples. I'm not. I'm kind of skipping over the port. Um, in here, you can see I, I've hard-coded the port into, uh, into the config.
but you can actually extract, um, you can get the port number out of, out of the DNS information as well. Um, it's a little more convoluted. You would ha then you would have to change your client to, uh, to do a, a more in-depth uh, DNS lookup. Um, not really my specialty, but um, we haven't done that yet, but you can't, the data is there. So in that, in that result, if you did that, then you would only have a, a service name in your, in your client config, which I thought was pretty cool. Any questions so far? Um, okay, so I'm just gonna walk you through the, the failover process. Uh, so this is the initial configuration. Um, the uh, REST master has come up and it's registered with console uh, as a master. So the, uh, here the console server sees host A as the master. It's now replicated that information out to the other console agents. So all the console um, processes agree that A is the, is the master. Sentinel at this point is hard coded in its configuration to consider A the master. So it agrees. So now the whole system agrees and the app is resolved, is, is able to, to write requests to, to host A. We have a failure. Sentinel um, promotes host B to master. And you can see now we have a slight disagreement. We're out of, out of phase. Sentinel notifies the Python script. And the Python script writes the update to the console agent. So at this point, what's happened, what's been written, is the tag information. So now, this was the original configuration. And now, once that, that Python script writes to that local agent, the only thing that's changed is just this is now says slave. And this now says master. That's where we're at there. The console agent replicates to the server. The server replicates out to the agent. And right shortly after that, the DNS mask will, or uh, yeah, DNS mask and the console agent will start resolving to the new to the correct host. And responsiveness is um, not quite as good as a direct sentinel link. And it's configurable, but it's never going to be as good as having your application communicating directly with Sentinel. That's as fast as you can get. You know, you're looking at four to 10 seconds, give or take. In this case, you got a Sentinel failover, 3,100 milliseconds minimum. You know, that's, that's normal. That's configurable. Um, then you have your, your just normal network re replication, um, plus or minus 250 milliseconds. Um, and then you have your DNS TTL. And I just threw five seconds in there. That's a pretty fast TTL. I think most, we do like, most of the times we do like 60 second TTLs on our nodes. But uh, um, we played around with these numbers and we found five seconds was a little on the fast side. We, it seemed to incur a little bit of extra latency for some reason. And when we backed this off to about 10, uh, that seemed to be a pretty good, pretty good number. So five to 10. And at, at five seconds, you you're, you're still only have uh, about a uh, little over eight seconds for a failover. And I think, if I remember correctly, is it five? Five nines is like 20 seconds a month. So you, you still have plenty of room to maintain five nines uptime, uptime for your Redis instance, even there. Also notice that um, if you do a manual failover, uh, you exclude, you can subtract that. So then you're down to about five seconds. Um, so that's almost it. Then just a couple more little things. Um, it works for Twin Proxy. Uh, we use Twin Proxy a lot. And uh, if you're not familiar with Twin Proxy, here's a, here's a similar or a sample, kind of a snippet from the Twin Proxy YAML config. And um, when you have uh, sharded nodes in Twin Proxy, you list the servers out uh, uh, in a bulleted list. And typically, you'll have the host name, port, and then a priority here. Um, but in this case, instead of a host name, just like before, we're going to use the, the full console uh, service name, tag. And you can see it's, they're both, now they're both master.redis-cache-. Dash and now we've added a little suffix to that, to that service name. We've added a dash A and a dash B to note the different, the different um, uh, shards, right? So, and they're both master. And so these masters are going to have their own slaves. Those slaves will be registering for the corresponding service using the different tabs exactly as before. This works perfect. It works really well. So.
Uh, okay, so DNS mask, we're having a little tr we've been having some trouble with it. We have some issues that we haven't quite figured out. Uh, one is the TTL, which I talked about before. Um, this graph was just here in case we wanted to talk to it. Um, and then uh, the big problem that we haven't yet actually resolved, but we have some ideas how to, how to fix it, is um, if console goes down, um, uh, then the DNS mask uh, will resolve until the TTL's up, and it'll stop resolving that, that service name. Big problem. Uh, you can imagine if, you, if you've implemented this across all of 60 of your Redis instances, and you have a, a console failure, you've just lost your Redis layer. So um, this is a bit of a blocker for us, although we have some ideas on how to fix it. I think uh, my favorite so far is actually patching DNS mask so that um, when, the, uh, when the TTL goes up, uh, it doesn't just discard the, the resolution, it, it caches it uh, in case the, uh, um, uh, the console agent is, is unresponsive, and it would just maintain that the previous uh, the previous uh, resolution. Okay, and then the fun stuff, fun future stuff. Um, we're going to be trying to open source that little Python code, um, maybe even with like some, um, you know, uh, testing and whatnot. Uh, that's going to take me a little bit just to clean it up. Um, also, um, one really cool thing, I've actually, um, uh, earlier this year I had a rather large project leading up to this involving Docker. And um, I was trying to make uh, a Redis platform. And we got pretty darn far with it. Um, and it was working quite well. We, we ran into some problems with uh, some of the proprietary deploy utilities in Yahoo. But um, I'm still trying to open source. I'd like to try to open source my work there because it was, it was pretty, pretty cool. And for example, um, Sentinel, as you go up here, you can see that here I've hard coded Sentinel's config to the IP address, which is normal, and we should all be familiar with that. But if you if you use, you can actually uh, have Sentinel monitor doc, uh, sorry, monitor console with a second uh, Python script uh, that that instead of subscribing to Sentinel and notifying console, it does it the opposite way. The sec the other Python script will monitor, will watch console, and then update Sentinel's config. So that when the Redis instance um, comes on, registers itself, it notices that and alerts Sentinel, and Sentinel starts mon starts monitoring it right away. Uh, that was pretty cool. It worked like magic. It was I was really excited about that. We might implement that. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. You're talking about Docker. Yeah, okay, so I think what you're saying is is um, the internal Redis instance has one IP and then the Docker image has a second. Yeah, so that was actually a limitation. It's sort of, uh, if you if you try to work this with Docker, you, you it became, it was our experience that you should, first of all, you should just um, align the IP address of the, of each Redis instance with the host, uh, with the host, so it doesn't have this, the separated um, network uh, network ID, and then ultimately we just ended up doing. I, there's a Docker, um, there's a Docker attribute that just eliminates the network that uses the host network layer, um, and we did that, and we even gained a little bit of performance by 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 using that. Yeah. Right. That's optional. Yeah, so the name, the name doesn't necessarily correspond to an IP address. It's, the name is just sort of an internal, yeah, to, oh, no, no, no. The name is, is just um, kind of a handle for the Docker container, for the Docker uh, container. Um, but then whether or not the, the, internal, the, the internal container has the same IP address as the host, uh, that's actually separate and it's configurable. You can just turn that off. So the internal C is on the exact same network layer as, as the host. They, they, does that make sense? Yeah, and that, and that was, that does sort of, you know, I think a lot of like Docker purists would, you know, kind of stick their nose up at that. They don't like the idea of doing it, but you, you get like these really tremendous kind of awesome benefits of Docker, um, uh, you know, and, and you get to use Redis, and Redis instances can just kind of pop in and out of existence on the network, and it'll just starts monitoring them right away, so, yeah. I'd be happy to tell you, you know, talk more about that. Thing. 
Um, yeah, so that was it. Yeah, and then Docker, yeah, basically with those two things, then you throw it in there with Docker, and you have this really cool uh, Redis platform. Um, so um, maybe that's a different talk sometime. <laughs> okay, and then uh, shameless advertising here. Uh, we're hiring. We have a lot of really cool stuff that we're that we've been that we have been and are continuing to work on. Um, we have jobs in all of these areas right now. Uh, so if anything looks interesting, let me know. I have business cards for my boss. And what I'm going to talk about today is a little bit um, is somewhat similar to what actually uh, Sentinel and Console accomplished, but it was done before it existed. So it's sort of a pattern that. We used, um, there's actually a couple of patterns that we're going to um, talk about and see some um, diagrams. But um, um, all of them solved a certain specific thing that wasn't available at the time. And I think jury is still out how well console, um, Sentinel, uh, Redis all worked in collaboration. But clearly, it's growing pretty quickly. So quickly, um, just a background. So. Um, Obviously, we're going to walk through some examples built at Vanilla. And um, if you don't know Vanilla, we are sort of a um, shopping mall of the future. It's kind of like you think of it as a tourist for shopping, um, Tumblr for shopping, or Twitter for shopping. You can follow people. You can follow stores. And um, therefore, because you can follow things, you have feeds, um, sort of like a product feed, a personalized product feed for you. And um, those personalized product feeds are typically implemented using something like this, right? We want to be able to very quickly uh, retrieve information about user's feed, uh, pre-computed ahead of time, and potentially limited to certain fixed number of items. And if the user goes past that, we will potentially use a different algorithm that's slower. Um, and so that's how we had approached um, feeds from the beginning. Um, but if you just want to kind of take a look at the high level of what sort of architecture is, it's a very very traditional, sort of simple, in a way, uh, Rails application for a website. There's a background workers. There's different types of storages. There's transient, permanent. We use Postgres very actively. I'm actually speaking at Postgres conference uh, next week. Um, and um, it was a really interesting pattern and, and just evolution on how we went from a really, really small um, database to basically multi-million user uh, Rails application, serving tens of thousands of hundreds of thousands of requests per minute. So it was interesting, right? And so Redis played a really key role in it. Um, and uh, I would say that we've taken advantage of it very heavily. And so here's some examples of where we would use it. Obviously, we use Psychic. I'm sure many of you know Psychic. Um, it's a um, multi-threaded background job processing framework um, for Ruby. And um, uh, Psychic uses Redis. We've um, actually taken Psyche concept a little bit further by um, splitting. So, so one of the thing, problems we've had, um, and that's a probably a common problem occurring in a lot of rail sites, is that as you start growing, um, as your usage of background jobs starts growing, as you start inserting more and more and more jobs into Redis, um, there becomes a competition, right? So each web request potentially producing one or two or three job uh, requests. And uh, we actually, uh, at the time, were using just a single Redis right, server for uh, Psychic. And um, during a high traffic event, one time, all of our servers went down, um, apparently because um, Redis stopped responding. It was a very momentary, um, momentary error. But uh, what actually happened is uh, it stopped uh, accepting connections. And so as we were getting these problems, we were solving them. So we're sort of like, in incremental approach to, um, to to scaling. And so in this particular case, what we did is we did actually two things. Um, one is we did, um, what we did is we created a failover Redis that wasn't actual failover. That was, I would say, an overflow. And the way it worked, it sat behind HAProxy. And HAProxy treated the primary Redis as a, as a, as a main primary front end and then Sorry, back end. And then the, the overflow Redis as a, sec, um, as a secondary. And what happened is during a similar situation, if it ever happened, we would basically just start inserting just jobs into the failover Redis. Um, and that Redis was attached or um, was connected to um, by 
another set of psychic jobs, a very small dedicated pool that would make sure that these overflow jobs keep processing. So lots of different sort of uh, band-aid solutions to problems of kind of resilience and, um, and high reliability. Um, and some of them um, actually, despite the fact that they seem really kind of crude and simple, um, I think that they really work for us well. Um, so moving on, I think what we've done here is um, sort of a different types of applications where we use for Redis. Um, the interesting one, I think, is one of the uh, bottom ones. So constraining various user events to be no frequent than X in time. It's actually used by one of our libraries, which we open source. It's called Pause. Um, and um, it's a really um, configurable library that allows you to allows the user to basically specify all sorts of specific uh, constraints like this. And it ensures using Redis, again, that um, none of these constraints are met. And so it's really useful for calculating don't send email more than twice a week or so on. So it's open source. So this is kind of next. We were growing pretty quickly. And so user feeds, which we just talked about, um, they are internally represented actually relatively simply. It's generally keyed by a user ID, some sort of a hash. And um, like I said before, it contains a fixed set or a list of elements. And as number of users grows, so does the Redis. And so initially, we stored it on single Redis instance, but we had to shut it sooner or later. Um, and so again, this might be slightly outdated, but my personal opinion, I think Redis is a fantastic thing, and I will keep using it on um, probably most of my projects. Um, but as a general, um, I guess as an architect or a developer, I still lean towards Postgres for critical transactional data. And I don't think Redis um, contains that. Um, but for feeds, transient, and easy to store data, it was a perfect choice. So let's see. So um, there are actually a couple of HA options in addition to um, what was mentioned earlier. So HA proxy is a fantastic proxy that can be used in front of Redis as well. Um, it can also be used in front of Twin Proxy. And Twin Proxy can be used in front of Redis. <laughs> so you get this interesting um, number of permutations. And so Chef um, deserves a whole other talk. But Chef is actually a really good way to um, not make kind of a hash-based configuration, YAML-based configuration, be a huge pain in your ass. Um, it's a way for you to programmatically create those configurations and not have to worry about it. And that's exactly what we've done. And so without having any built-in tools for horizontal scaling of Redis, we build our own using Twin Proxy, HA Proxy, and Chef. Um, Twin Proxy is fantastic. You all know about it. Um, Manju was, Manju was really um, awesome and uh, ported it for us to SmartOS which way we're running, we're on joint. It's practically Solaris, so um, thank you, Manju. And um, Twin Proxy gave us sharding and connection pooling. So what we had now is we had a bunch of Redis shards on different machines. Um, they all had different RDB file, and they were all small, instead of having one really, really big one. So the way it worked is that each, each safe was much, much quicker, and they were happening all over the place in parallel, and they were off sync with each other. So we'll talk about that a bit later. So Twin Proxy is in front of it here, and we talked to Twin Proxy from an application server, um, which talks through um, HA Proxy. So in a way, we have this kind of chain, like I said, HA Proxy, Twin Proxy, um, and then Redis. And it seems like a long way, but it worked really, really fast <laughs> and really, really reliably. Um, I think um, we've, um, and I think this is something on something everyone that's using cloud should be expecting. I don't think we can expect the cloud to be always up. I think servers, um, servers are still based on hardware. They'll come up and come down, come down. You may be running on a cheaper cloud. I don't know. Um, in our situation, because of use of Redis 
um, behind HAProxy and TwinProxy. We were um, protected in many ways. Any, any of these TwinProxy servers could have died and nothing would have changed because of HAProxy. And um, if Redis server died, um, sp small portion of our users would be affected. So it would be localized. It would not be necessarily live, but it would be localized. We also ensured that uh, when there were errors, when we couldn't talk to Redis, application behave in a way that was gracefully degraded. So it wasn't a problem. So talked about, oh, sorry, question? No? Sure. Um, so what happened when the Redis, when the host um, that's hosting multiple Redis instances dies? And that certainly happened. Well, first of all, we tried not to put too many Redis instances on the same host. Um, I think number of shards we used was anywhere between 256, 64. I mean, it's sort of one of those things where you have to reshard where each shard becomes too large, but you can never guess ahead of time, like how big is your shards going to be and how quickly it's going to grow. So um, the way our backup failure in store worked is we, if the left machine died, then what would happen um, is we would provision another machine using Chef, and Chef would know that uh, the role contains Redis, and it would have to provision Redis. And the recipe was written in such a way that it would look first at NFS partition and see, is there a backup there? And if there was backup, it would copy it over, and the Redis would come up. And so the worst case scenario would be the delay uh, between the two backups. And so that delay was maximum about five, uh, 10, 10 minutes, um, because the left machine was dumping every 10 minutes, I think, to the RDB file. And the rsync was running every minute and, and dumping any changed files to the NFS. Again, duct tape, I don't know, worked really well. <laughs> um, then, um, this was actually before. Um, before we uh, even sharded, one of the reasons we actually were forced to shard it, even in the places where we didn't want to, <laughs> was the fact that we were having some issues with the way Solaris memory management, or SmartOS memory management, and Redis interacted. In particular, SmartOS really liked to allocate memory when you ask for it. Really allocate memory, not the way Linux does it. <laughs> like pretend to. So what was happening is, uh, when we had a one real large Redis instance, 32 gig, um, we actually did run it in a master slave configuration on SmartOS. But then when it got so big that it was half RAM, it would fork itself in order to save, but then there wouldn't be enough RAM for both of them to coexist. So it would start, operating system would start copying data, it would start growing, but then it would fail, and the replication process would try again, <laughs> and try again, and so the whole thing would loop. And this is how we decided that, bad, that big Redis is bad, <laughs> and went to small shards, which I think is um, actually a better uh, concept. In a way, if you think about it, you have lots and lots of um, small files which are easier to maintain um, in terms of consistency. It almost reminds me of the sparse bundle that um, Apple has, this uh, secure disk format. Lots of little bands of fixed size. Yeah, so what was happening in this case when it was forking, um, the master process was blocked. It was not taking any connections in, and all the requests were timing out. So this was bad. Thanks. I know it was really short, but I wanted to kind of generally um, give you this pattern right here that we used. Um, we um, almost open sourced this cookbook. I think it's probably going to come out soon. Um, and um, all it does, it allows us to specify configuration in a simple YAML file format. And it generates all the shards. It generates all of the specifications for each one of them. And so when you boot a, pro, a you know, specific machine, um, it just creates all that for you and either starts them clean or copies the data from the NFS. Um, we thought about that. I think this would have been done if it was a problem that was consistently occurring. But because it wasn't, we just were like on a manual. Like I said, one of the things that I really don't think people are doing enough is um, kind of evaluating what is the risk and what is the, you know, like do you really need 99.9999%, right? 
And so we've done, we, we've, we've challenged ourselves every time we built a feature. It was like, okay, what is the, what is the allowable risk? Can we, can we run with this feature being down for all users? For how long? And so, so that sort of thing. And so um, when we built things like feeds, and there was always a way to kind of redirect user to some, another feed, it didn't seem like a, that big of a deal. So, uh, of course, if we were building financial application, things would be very different. Um, but this gave us a lot of flexibility on kind of how to think and how to do it. But today, this uh, Redis cluster is uh, rather enormous. Uh, I want to say it's close to maybe 400 gigs in RAM. So, I mean, enormous by our standards. I'm sure there's bigger ones. But, um, um, yeah, so it runs on join, and I think, in particular, join has been really good for us in terms of stability. Uh, we do have you know hosts going up and down all the time, but like in this situation, if it, if it just restarts, it's almost not noticeable. Um, so yeah, so I think that we were kind of waiting for that to happen, but then we had to deploy something before it was ready. And at this point, I don't really see why would we spend a, the, a, an effort to do this. I mean, I think this solution actually very adequately um, serves its purpose. I think that the um, risk versus recovery sort of a ratio is acceptable. I think if it changes or if our cloud provider starts crashing all the time, you know, things may need to be reconsidered. But I think that, I mean, I look briefly at the cluster and I think the combination of cluster, Sentinel, and console to me seems like not a very simple thing to to configure and understand. And so there's a certain overhead. Maybe it's a mental overhead. Maybe it's a configuration overhead. And so it's just a good question to question yourself. Like, do I really need um, that? I mean, the good thing about it is that if we invest that overhead ahead of time, you know, you kind of have that already resolved. And, and as your cluster grows, you don't have to worry about it. But it certainly needs to come at the right time. We um, only had to reshard, I think, one of the clusters. We actually ran four of them uh, for the totally separate feeds. One of them we had to reshard, um, I think, because it was configured with too few shards. And so they, they got too big. Um, and then we had to reshard. Re the thing about it is that, again, these are feeds. And the cool thing about feeds is that if we create a new cluster, we can populate them both. So because it's only containing new information and the old information becomes kind of increasingly relevant, we can run this for a while, get both of them up to date, and then both all the new cluster contain information that's equivalent, and then we just switch. I can look it up. I don't remember what exact. I think we're using something. Katama, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, whatever was recommended, I think. Um, there was one interesting um, um, thing that we noticed at one point. Redis, so Joint had, um, like any cloud provider, has a different generation of the hardware. Um, and um, sometimes it takes um, quite a bit of a trickery to figure out which one <laughs> you're on. But um, in this case, no trickery was needed. We had some Redis shards running at 10x performance of the others. And we were trying to figure out what was going on. And turned out that I think this was when Redis introduced um, compression. Or maybe they had it from the beginning, I'm not sure. And so we were using, Tim Proxy was talking compressed. Uh, maybe, maybe it was SSL, I can't remember, one of the two, maybe both. Um, and so what was happening is um, on the old hardware, our Redis instances were doing all of that in software. And then, generation of hardware jumped, and suddenly all of that happening on CPU. So both SSL operations and GZIP, L, whatever, LWD, um, LZ algorithm, that was called, are, um, have been released as part of that chip. And so they were running in hardware, and it was literally 10x performance. We were really surprised, but it was just like, whoa, why is the latency 20 milliseconds, and here it's two. <laughs> And then once we figured this out, we just migrated everything to where it was too. <laughs> but um, one of the things um, that I would say after that, just really important to kind of keep track of 
things and monitor things, which we do through all sorts of uh, tools. Any other questions? Awesome. Thank you so much.